Welcome to this webinar on the menopause and how diet, HRT and lifestyle can improve your health during and after the menopause. My name is Marianne Williams and I'm a specialist gastroenterology dietitian and I'm joined today by two menopause specialists. Hi, I'm Kath Munro. I'm a GP up in Kendal in South Lakes and I'm a British Menopause Society accredited menopause specialist. I've particularly had an interest in women's health and over the last three to five years have developed much more of an interest in menopause and perimenopause, partly because that's been my own journey and partly because it's been something that I realised uh, over time women were being perhaps not as well treated as they could be and I just saw it as my my role to pick that up within the experience that I have already. Hi I'm Leah Seamark and I'm a community gastroenterology dietitian working for Somerset NHS Foundation Trust and my interest in menopause really stemmed from the fact that I within my clinics I was seeing lots of women going through the menopause who were suffering with gut symptoms and that's kind of where my interest in this in area stemmed. So I want to start by looking at what is the menopause yeah, and it's an interesting thing because we all talk about menopause, don't we? But actually, if you split menopause down, meno is monthly and pause is stop. Um, so it's really uh, one day in our lives, which is the year after our last period. Um, simplifying it, that is just what it is, just one year after that last period. OK. And what about the actual perimenopause? Because you hear a lot of people talk about the perimenopause and the menopause. And sometimes I'm a bit confused as to you know what the difference is. Yeah, so the perimenopause is any time building up to that last day, which is 12 months after our last period. Um, and it's a period of instability of our hormones. It's a period where we might start to see things change. Um, it's a time when our periods are becoming more irregular. Um, yeah, so it, it's a, it's the build up to that time. So your um, periods can, can they become really, because I know a lot of people I've spoken to said their periods become unbelievably heavy during this time. Is that the case with everybody? Uh, it's really variable and, and it often changes for one person. So, you know, I think it's not uncommon to start noticing your periods getting closer together for a time and possibly quite light, but then becoming more spaced out. And for some people, they don't get any more than just a bit heavy, but for some, they can become really heavy with clots. Um, and, uh, you know, become a real problem that needs uh, needs some active management. OK, and why why is this happening? What is, what is actually happening to our body at this time when we're going through the perimenopause and the menopause? Um, so it's, it, this diagram is really uh, good to be able to explain things in a little bit more detail. So in our reproductive years, it, you know, not every there is no normal, I think it's important to say. But the biological description of what happens in our reproductive years is that we have a monthly cycle where our estrogen and our progesterone, amongst other hormones, um, go, become very regularly or change very regularly through the cycle. Uh, so that usually in a, in a normal, uh, if there is one 28 day cycle, we'll see changes, uh, peaks and troughs in our hormone level. But as we move into perimenopause, our hormones become quite unpredictable and they can spike and uh, peak and trough very quickly within um, a short period of time, uh, you know, within a day, within a few hours. And I think those that ex have experienced perimenopause will know how things can feel, uh, what that can feel like. So the hormones start to change and that's that's what drives out the change in our periods, as well as all the other symptoms that we start to see. And then just as we move into the postmenopause period, those hormones uh, reduce slowly and become plateaued at a lower level. And that's when people tend to um, move away from some of the, maybe not all of the symptoms, but, uh, but, but many of the symptoms that we attribute to that uh, unstable perimenopausal phase. So what, what are the other causes of the menopause? Because you, you hear of people saying, well, I went through a very early menopause because I had a certain surgery, etc. What are the other causes? Um, so if we think that what what's going on is our ovaries are reducing their production of estrogen, if we suddenly didn't have our ovaries, that would cause a sudden removal of our estrogen. And so in a surgical menopause, so if somebody undergoes a hysterectomy and their ovaries are removed, one day they will have their estrogen and the next they won't. And that can be a quite, I think some people would describe it as a catastrophic change in symptoms due to that sudden drop in estrogen. Um, another way that we can experience menopause is through uh, surgical treatment or medical treatment. So uh, things like having radiotherapy or chemotherapy uh, can damage to the can damage the ovaries, and um, so can then create a menopause because of um, the, the impact of those on um, on the ovaries themselves and their function. 
Okay, so there's lots. It's, you know, it, it, for some people, it's more that it's uh, caused by an intervention rather than just a natural exactly. process. Yeah. So when do we expect to actually go through the menopause? So it's really interesting, and I think it, it it's a really um, uh, interesting subject to talk about overall. Um, if we think about the average age of menopause, and the thing, if we look in a book for that, the average age is 51. Uh, but that is, again, going back to the definition, that is 51 is the average age that is a year beyond our last period. So an, an average age of your last period might be around 50. And if we then think, well, perimenopause can occur for a good while before that. Sometimes, again, look in a textbook, it says five to seven years. But I think for a lot of women, um, how I like to describe it is I think when we certainly when I learned about uh, reproductive health, I kind of thought there's puberty, then there's our reproductive life and then boxed off is menopause and then it's all done. But I think when we think about it, it's much more gradual and much more of a journey than that. Um, and so, you know, as we get into our 40s, I think we might notice some period changes. We might notice the odd time of feeling a bit hotter. Um, but yet five to seven years is about an average that you would find if you looked in a textbook. Um, so, you know, it wouldn't be unusual at 45 to be starting to feel some symptoms. And actually, um, so NICE guidance um, and British Menopause Society guidance would say that over 45 for women exhibiting symptoms or experiencing symptoms and some impact, no blood tests are needed to diagnose perimenopause. HRT is a good option. Um, some women are experiencing symptoms between the age of 40 and 45. Um, and the British Menopause Society would say that you need two blood tests to diagnose um perimenopause in that situation, uh, two sets of tests, four to six weeks apart. Um, but what's interesting, I think, to know is, and what I think is probably missed a little bit in the medical community, is that it's not that unusual to experience what's called premature ovarian insufficiency. So where your um, ovaries have stopped working under the age of 40, one in 100, I think, you know, I'm in a practice of 17,000. So half of those are women. There's a good chunk of women experiencing what we call POI. And um, I mean, we could go into a little bit more of the impact of that specifically. And one in a thousand under 30. So the younger you are, the more likely it is attributable to um, chromosome deficient chromosome abnormalities or specific conditions. Um, but it is just worth knowing that it can happen under 40. OK, so keeping your eyes open, because I know I have spoken to some people who've had dreadful mental symptoms and and physical symptoms uh, under 40 and it wasn't for several years that they suddenly discovered that actually it was because they were going through a premature uh, menopause so it is something to to bear in mind absolutely right yeah okay um so what are the actual menopause symptoms because a lot of talk about this and and Kath I, I know that you're you're keen to emphasize that it can affect so many areas of the body. Is that right? Uh, absolutely right. Yeah. Top to bottom. You know, I, I think, you know, if you um, looked at a hair cell or a skin cell um, or any cell in the body, uh, there, uh, the majority of them will have estrogen receptors. And so the impact of not having estrogen around in our bodies um, can be wide ranging from if we go from the top hair loss um, skin changes on our faces, dry eyes, dry mouth. You know, I, I won't list them all, but um, just to kind of, uh, you know, mood changes, um, bloating, um, digestive problems, joint pains bone thinning, osteoporosis, all sorts of symptoms that perhaps people don't realize. I think sometimes it's a, a retrospective realization when you, if you were to go onto HRT or when you start to look into your symptoms a bit more, you think, ah, I've had those for years and didn't quite realize that that was the reason why. Um, so yeah, wide ranging symptoms um, and uh, lots of things that can be done about it. Some of the ones that we really uh, hear a lot about are things like tiredness. Um, and why is tiredness so associated with the menopause? Yeah, tiredness is interesting because I think it comes in, in several different packages. It can be related to mood and uh, feeling low, feeling anxious, um, that our bodies will often feel tired in response to that. It can just be that it's sleep related, that we're um, you know, it's a common symptom to have interruption to our sleep during perimenopause and menopause. Um, and so we can feel tired because of that. But I think generally as well, we might feel more achy. Uh, you know, we might feel less motivated for all sorts of reasons that we can attribute to a feeling of tiredness. That's interesting you say about achy, actually, because I remember in my sort of mid 40s starting to get joint pains for no apparent reason, mm -hmm. or sort of late 40s, uh, and wondering if that was to do with the perimenopause. Is that something that's quite common? 
really common. Yeah, I think it's one of the most common symptoms. I see aches and pains and that noticeable difference. And I would say I, I've experienced the same, Marianne. Um, mm. You know, going on to some HRT, you realize actually, oh, my bones, mm. uh, my, my joints feel like they're moving better. And that's because, you know, there's estrogen receptors around the joints and in the muscles, as well as testosterone receptors as well, which we might want to touch on later. Mm. Um, but certainly, you know, having not having estrogen around will impact around our joints and our muscles and make them feel less good. But that's not a reason that we shouldn't be winding back it should be a reason why we start which we'll again come to later yeah absolutely and and the hot flushes obviously this is a big one that people talk about but I noticed that when I talk amongst my friends and we're all sort of in our 50s that you know some people get the most appalling hot flushes they seem to have hot flushes you know several times a day if not you know a lot more than that and myself I didn't get any hot flushes so it seems to be very variable well what's what's behind that do we know I, I I don't think we know really, um, and except to say, you know, there are lots of um, there's lots of evidence around about the severity of symptoms and what that might be related to. Um, but different, you know, everyone's experience. If you think of all the places that we can experience symptoms, not everyone's going to have the same. Um, and uh, you know, some people might just have a feeling of heat. Some people might actually perspire and get sweaty. Um, but yeah, a hot flush. I think many people would describe them differently. And so I like you didn't have really experienced hot flushes during the day I've not been one of those people that has to have the windows open and be in a, a short sleeve shirt but at night time I would feel hot and if my husband I, put yeah. a hand on me mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. feel like I was sat on a boiler yeah um, so absolutely. yeah very strange mm -hmm. symptoms but mm -hmm. not um uh but yeah everyone's are quite different but there's there's definitely something around the way our bodies regulate temperature related to estrogen mm -hmm. Very interesting you say about that at night, because I did go through a patch where, you know, the bed would literally be wet uh, at night, uh, but I wasn't getting the hot flushes during the day. So I wasn't mm. connecting the two. I was thinking, yeah. oh, I'm just getting over hot at night and I need to wear, you know, have less duvets on. But actually what you're saying is that could be my version of the hot flushes. I'm just not mm -hmm. getting them during the day. So everybody's very different. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mood swings. This is something that I'm... Um, a lot of people talk about uh, anxiety, uh, overthinking things that they never used to worry about uh, and moving from feeling awful one minute and quite depressed to feeling absolutely fine five minutes later. Uh, that sort of irrational mood swings. I is this part of the menopause? Yeah. I mean, as we said before, um, you know, the graph that we showed um, or that chart mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, you know, again, going back to I think we, we're, we'll all those of us that have had cycles, reproductive cycles, will know that we feel different at different parts of the month. Um, and so moving into perimenopause, when those hormones start to roller coaster, um, there's almost a direct correlation or it's an easy way to understand. Actually, that that's why, you know, sometimes we'll feel great. And in a slump of hormones, we might suddenly feel quite terrible. You know, and um, and so, yeah, it, it, it's related to those swings in hormones that can really have an impact on how we feel right in the moment there and then. I think that's so helpful to understand. And it seems so simple now when you see it on your graph here, mm. um, because it is really uh, concerning when you're going through it. You're thinking, why? How come I am feeling absolutely awful now? And I know that in 10 minutes time, I'll probably feel much better. So it's really useful to see that graph and understand that these like you. I think your description of a roller coaster is such a good description mm. because it mm. is like that. You're up and down and it's really just very unpredictable. A lot of people talk about weight gain and the fact that they feel they gain weight. What is what's the reasons behind this? Um, so I think there's a little bit about um, embracing the changes of middle life. Um, I think, you know, we need to acknowledge that, that things will change. Our bodies naturally, as we as we lose, our, again, thinking about that chart and the way our estrogen levels are changing, our bodies want to maintain a, a supply of estrogen. Um, and the only way we can do that is through fat tissue. Um, and so we start to deposit fat tissue um, in different places because fat produces something called estrone, which is similar to estrogen, but not as nice as estrogen. It's actually quite an in inflammatory estrogen. Um, and so um, having um, having the, ch the drop in estrogen, our bodies want to create more fat. That's not to say we should accept a, a continuous weight gain because there are definitely things which can do about it but just to say that physiologically when our bodies are going through these changes um it's the way that our bodies want to move us 
So you're saying that um, fundamentally the body will lay down more fat in an attempt to produce a different type of estrogen to help keep our estrogen levels as high as it can. Exactly I, that. So exactly. yeah, I think that, I think the message is um, that we um, there are things that we can do to control to control it. Um, so it feels like we're out of control. It suddenly feels like we knew our bodies and now we don't. But I guess the, the whole message that I, I would like to think that we can convey is around regaining that control and looking at how we can do things better, even though we might never get, get back to that, the figure that we once had. And we should perhaps not aspire to be our 20 year old bodies. So what conditions can increase postmenopause? Because you hear people often say that postmenopause, the estrogen was protecting us against certain conditions and that we lose that protection. So one of the things that's been mentioned is estrogen effect that protects our bones from thinning. So estrogen, again, plays a really protective role in maintaining our bone density and our bone strength. So as our estrogen levels start to drop, our ability to maintain that bone density starts to go down. So you then have uh, a reduced bone strength and therefore that puts you increased <laughs> risk of breaking bones. So, you know, leading up to that perimenopause period, that's why it's so really, really important to try and get as high bone density as possible leading up to that as a protective factor. So it's trying to make sure that you have enough calcium in your diet to promote good bone health. It's about making sure you get sufficient vitamin D, which helps your body absorb the calcium it's about that weight bearing exercise so people talk about exercise being really important during the menopause and is this one of the reasons because you want to be doing weight bearing exercise that's going to help your bones uh, against that drop of estrogen yeah i mean exercise and bone health is, is one aspect but exercise plays a role in so many different you know managing symptoms related to the menopause so whether it is trying to help manage those increased risk of cardiovascular disease or metabolic syndrome, but also sort of general well-being. So we know that that period of time when people are going through the perimenopause and menopause, you know, it's very easy to forget about looking after yourself and that can therefore make symptoms worse. So, you know, exercise is so vitally important. So whether, you know, when I say exercise, it doesn't have to be at the gym. It's, you know, physical activity, moving your body. When it comes to osteoporosis, it's weight-bearing exercise, but they all it plays such a vital role in such a wide range of those menopause symptoms okay. and when we look at the, the changes um kath you take us through this um graph on the changes with our bone mass absolutely echo everything that leah was just saying and um you know we all um reach a peak bone mass uh, which is usually around our 20s and 30s um men and women uh, and just that, you know, the, the red here is women and the blue is male. And we can see that um, all of us have a drop um, as we age in our bone density. Um, and so uh, osteoporosis is a risk for everybody, male and female. But what we can see is that actually when we approach perimenopause, there is a big drop in bone loss at that time. About 10 percent of our bone mass is lost around perimenopause and menopause. Um, and then it slows down and it becomes much more in line with the with the male levels. Um, and I think what Leah was saying about activity and diet, you know, I, I think uh, one of the key messages that I, I, I make sure I pass on when I'm talking about this is that it's something that we can influence and change. So it feels like that graph says, huh, you know, we're all uh, we're all going to get this um, osteoporosis. But actually, we're, our bones remodel. Um, uh, you know, we get a new skeleton every 10 years, 10% 10 a year, our body, our bones are renewing. Um, and the more exercise and the more activity we do, and the, if we're eating the right foods and doing the right things, we can protect that. So actually, even though there's a decline, that decline can be less um, according to what we do, um, how we exercise, what we eat and the thing and our lifestyle. Um, so yeah, it's, um, we're all going to reduce our bone mass over time. I think it's important to say if you replace H, um, if you replace hormones, so if you go onto something like HRT, your bone density will stabilize for the time that you're on HRT. When you come off it, um, the uh, the bone density will drop down to where it would have been before. Um, so it's just worth knowing that you know estrogen does have a protective effect on our bones if we go back onto it um, in the form of HRT in later life. And uh, for for those that don't want to do HRT or can't do HRT, are we saying that, you know, exercise therefore becomes really quite fundamental and the diet becomes quite fundamental in trying to lessen this drop? Uh, absolutely. I think lifestyle is key, you know, so smoking, exercise or, or activity, I think, as Leah says, activity, you know, we don't want 
people put off by saying they need to go and sweat in the gym. This is about walking and um, uh, weight bearing exercise, weight bearing activity. There's a really good um, website, the Royal Osteoporosis Society website that has lots and lots of information around vitamin D sources, calcium sources, um, dietary things that can help protect our bones. And But it also has stuff about lifestyle in there as well. And I think it's just really important to recognize that there is there are things that we can do about this with or without estrogen replacement. And touching on that, I would say that the website you mentioned, Kathy, has got a really good calcium calculator. So yes. if you're looking at trying to make sure you get enough calcium in your diet, you know, leading up to the perimenopause period as well, it's really good source of information to kind of help you assess whether you need to increase your calcium intake or not. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's very I, I, I sat really smugly thinking that I had a fabulous calcium intake and then I did that checker, mm-hmm. realized I was um, really not where I needed to be and changed my diet as a result of that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, really good I think place as we go through this, it's we're going to be highlighting the fact that you kind of need to know where your starting place is and know exactly. yourself and know where you are in terms of your symptoms as well as your diet and your activity levels and Absolutely. actually think about that, you know, move to m- making more healthier lifestyle changes which are habits because it's our daily habits that are going to have a bigger impact on our long-term health rather than you know quick fix short changes so it's all about like you say knowing what your starting point is now and thinking about those changes which will be beneficial later on Uh, what we'll do is we'll add a link to that calcium calculator in the further information handout section so anybody listening to that you will be able to just click on the link and go to uh, the relevant page on that website In terms of dietary changes to help reduce the risk of developing osteoporosis, first up, we have calcium. So recommendations are trying to have about 700 milligrams of calcium a day. However, if you're on treatment for osteoporosis, that increases to about 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. So a good source of calcium include your dairy foods, so things like milk, yogurt, cheese, custard, rice pudding. And in terms of milk, you can obviously get calcium from your cow's milk, but you can also get calcium from the fortified versions of the many plant-based milks that are also available. So things like soya milk, oat, rice, coconut, almond, cashew, hemp milk. If you go for the fortified versions, they will also provide a source of calcium, unlike the organic versions, which unfortunately won't. So if you are opting for plant-based milk, please opt for the fortified versions and just make sure you give the carton a good old shake each time you use it to prevent the buildup of calcium to the bottom of the carton. Now, other good sources of calcium include things like green leafy vegetables, almonds, sesame seeds, which you may also have in the form of tahini, tin fish which includes bones so things like tin mackerel or sardines or pilchards which include the bones within them and other good sources include things like dried fruit and pulses and you can also get some fortified foods such as fortified breakfast cereals particularly the instant oat cereals are often fortified with calcium as well as some breads as well now if you feel that you may struggle to meet your requirements of calcium via your diet so for example 700 milligrams of calcium is the equivalent to about a pint of milk a day. If you think you may struggle to achieve that regularly, it may mean that you may want to consider a calcium supplement as a top up. But what we'll do is we'll include the British Dietetic Association fact sheet on calcium in the further information section of the website. So having enough calcium is important, but equally having enough vitamin D is important because vitamin D helps your body actually absorb that calcium. So the recommendations are trying to have about 10 micrograms of vitamin D a day. Now, sometimes in the summer months, we can get that through the sun via our skin. But actually, the recommendations are in the autumn and winter months that everyone considers a vitamin D supplement a day, which should be about 10 micrograms. Other things that you look at to help reduce the risk of developing osteoporosis, again, looking at limiting your alcohol intake and also, as previously mentioned, looking at stopping smoking and physical activity. And when it comes to physical activity to help prevent osteoporosis, what you're particularly looking at is weight bearing exercise. And that's the type of exercise where your body is actually carrying your weight. So, for example, if you're walking compared to something like swimming or maybe sitting on a bike, you're not carrying your weight. So actually, when it comes to osteoporosis, it's those weight bearing exercise which is going to be most important. 
Okay, so to summarise, Leah, you're saying that we need to really look at adequate intake of calcium and you can get that through dairy products, but there are lots of other foods that you can get calcium through as well. And we're going to attach a calcium information sheet to the further information handout section to accompany this webinar. But you're also looking at the fact that most people are, are um, advised to take a vitamin D supplement um, so that they can actually help absorb that calcium they're getting in their diet efficiently. And then there are other things like limiting your alcohol intake and making those lifestyle changes. All of that will help reduce the risk of you developing osteoporosis. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So we know about osteoporosis, but there are actually other medical conditions that can also increase postmenopause. One of those is known as metabolic syndrome, and many people won't have heard about this. Leah, could you take us through how metabolic syndrome and the menopause link together? So metabolic syndrome is a cluster of three conditions, including obesity, diabetes and high blood pressure. And when these occur together, someone's been deemed to have metabolic syndrome. And the reason why this condition increases postmenopausal is for numerous reasons. Firstly, Cathy mentioned that during the menopause, we gain weight, but also not only do we gain weight, but where our body stores fats also changes. So we also, because of the drop in estrogen, we are more likely to store fat around our organs, which is known as visceral fat, um, particularly around our liver. We're also more likely to store fat around our tummy regions. And those two types of fats are shown to be more inflammatory and are linked to other conditions such as insulin resistance, which can then lead on to diabetes. Another reason, so if we look at high blood pressure, estrogen plays a role in allowing our blood vessels to relax and widen, to allow blood to flow easily around our body. So when our estrogen levels start to drop, that can then lead to that process not working more efficiently and then lead on to the high blood pressure. So when you take that all together, that's one of the reasons why we have increased risk of metabolic syndrome post-menopause. And you're going to look also, Leah, at ways that we can try and reduce the risk of this condition because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, not everybody who goes through the menopause is going to end up with metabolic syndrome. Is that correct? No, absolutely. So there are various factors that play into it. So there are definitely things that you can do to help prevent this occurring. So that will include diet and lifestyle. Um, and they're things that we'll talk about shortly. Cardiovascular disease is another area of concern postmenopausal. What's the what's the uh, information around that? Yep. Yeah, so cardiovascular disease includes sort of heart attacks, strokes, and vascular dementia. And again, there's been a shown to be an increased prevalence of those conditions postmenopause, and that can be linked to things such as the metabolic syndrome that we've just mentioned. Um, also, estrogen can help control our cholesterol levels. So when our estrogen levels start to drop, we have increased levels of cholesterol, which can lead to that sort of fatty buildup within our blood vessels, which can lead to, again, poor blood flow to some of our organs, leading to some of those conditions. But again, there are protective factors, including diet and lifestyle, which are going to be really important to try and put into place. So when we look at the dietary changes, what sort of dietary changes should we be thinking about to try and reduce that risk of cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome? So knowing that the menopause can increase your risk of these conditions is really important. But what's equally important is recognising that you do have the ability to help reduce those risks and prevent them. They're not inevitable. And actually, there's lots that you can do to try and help reduce your risk. Now, firstly, it's looking to try and aim for a healthy weight. So when we look at weight, we often use body mass index, so BMI, which is an indication for your weight in relation to your height. Now, you can use the calculator available on the NHS website to calculate your BMI. And a healthy BMI is between 18.5 and 24.9. Now, that would be ideal. However, we recognise that for lots of people, that may not be realistic. So if you are someone who is carrying excess weight, you don't necessarily have to be aiming for that healthy BMI to achieve some health benefits. So anyone who is overweight, aiming to lose between 5 to 10% of your body weight has been shown to lead to some significant health changes. 
that can include things like reducing your cholesterol levels or reducing your blood pressure. So it's looking at trying to make small changes that you can be able to maintain for the long term. We recognise that in this period of time, if you are going through the menopause, trying to achieve weight loss can be particularly challenging, not only because you're trying to manage some of the symptoms, but also those challenges that you may have in this period of your life. So, you know, juggling work, life balance, relationships, you know, looking after children or elderly relatives can all make making lifestyle changes quite challenging. So it's recognizing that it's not going to be one solution suits all. So what we'll do in the further information section is direct you to some resources that you may want to look at if you're trying to aim for some weight loss. The next thing to look at is balanced diet. So when we talk about balanced diet, it's about trying to include all those foods that provide your body with the nutrients it needs. And when we look at trying to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome, there are some key nutrients that we want to look at. So firstly, one of the things you can do is to include more plant-based foods within your diet. So plant-based foods include your fruits and vegetables. So it's aiming for your five portions of fruit and vegetables a day. But as well as that, it's including plenty of other plant based foods. So things like nuts and seeds and lentils and pulses, herbs and whole grains, because the more diverse our intake of those foods, the better for our gut health and therefore our overall health limits your intake of saturated fats so that's the fats that you find on animals and animal products and swap them for some of the healthier plant-based fats so they're the sort of fats that you find in things like avocado or olive oil or sunflower seeds Another thing which has been shown to have a protective effect includes the fat omega-3. So omega-3 has been shown to improve cholesterol levels as well as lower blood pressure. And you can get omega-3 from oily fish, which includes sardines, mackerel, pilchers, salmon, white bait. And there are some frozen fish products, so things like frozen fish fingers, which are fortified with omega-3. And they'll be highlighted on the packaging. And in terms of recommendations, we would recommend having at least two portions of fish a week and at least one of those should be oily. Now, if you're someone who doesn't like oily fish or doesn't eat fish at all, there are other ways to include omega-3s in your diet. So first up, you've got things like your green leafy vegetables, nuts, especially walnuts, and some of your seeds, including linseeds, pumpkin seeds, and hemp seeds. So they all provide some sort of omega-3. There are also a few other foods which are fortified. So certain brands of eggs are fortified with omega-3. We're also looking at trying to limit our intake of sugary foods and drinks as well. And Leah, this is a really interesting point, actually, because we know that research consistently shows that sugars can be harmful and can be associated with increased risk for obesity, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And I know that recent research has really suggested that we should reduce the consumption of our free sugars or added sugars to below 25 grams a day, which is roughly six teaspoons a day, and limiting our consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages to less than one serving a week. So really, sugar intake and limiting it is very much an important part of maintaining a balanced diet. Kath, from your perspective, when you're seeing patients in your GP clinic, what are the sort of lifestyle changes you particularly focus on when we're trying to prevent these risks developing postmenopausally? Yeah, it's a really, I, I like to, and it's another reason that I um, really was um, driven to do something around menopause, because when we talk about risks and risk management, there's such an opportunity. There is all through our lives, but I think in midlife, when we're feeling different anyway there's an opportunity to start thinking about the things that we have an influence over and we can gain control over and there, so there are obvious things like stopping smoking um which although it's obvious isn't always easy and for those people that are smoking in midlife it's definitely worth speaking to their practice or um uh, some stop smoking support services about how they can go about that about managing alcohol intake i think it's something both smoking and alcohol that we do see women reach for more sometimes around menopause and perimenopause because they're things that kind of suppress stress and give um, give relief in the short term but actually we also know that when we increase our alcohol intake that can sometimes affect our sleep and it can, look, can also make us more anxious so it can become a bit of a vicious cycle uh, but yeah definitely reducing alcohol so that it's within normal uh, recommended limits of the 14 units per week but 
minimizing I think within that as well is really important and sometimes that's done through necessity because people feel like they can't drink like they used to uh, but other times I think it is just worth bearing in mind um, uh, that the the impact that alcohol can have throughout our bodies but particularly on our mood and also actually interestingly on our bones and um, so minimizing alcohol and certainly drinking within safe limits. Being active is super important. And, and I think deliberately saying being active rather than, than doing exercise or increasing exercise, because activity can be all sorts of things. You don't need to be a gym bunny, but you know, regular walking, um, doing regular exercise or activity that increases your heart rate just a bit. We know that there's evidence that increasing activity reduces breast cancer risk, for instance. Um, and so it's just really important to think about doing activity, but particularly, things that you enjoy. Uh, so don't start something brand new that doesn't feel what you want to do because you'll never stick with it, but pick something that you enjoy. And optimizing weight, you know, and you know, it, it's, it's hard, I think, um, after a lifetime um, of eating in certain ways to start thinking about changing that, certainly when every, I think the, the key here is not to do everything all at once, but to pick, pick the easy wins and then start to work on things gradually over time. So looking at what you're eating, looking at how you're eating, is really, really important. Um, and getting those fruit and vegetables in and packing those in is really, really important. So we've talked a lot about the benefits of trying to manage your weight and you can find lots more resources on our patient webinars website. So there's a weight management section. So in there, you'll find a series of webinars which discuss some of the tips to help with weight management. And in the further information section, there's some good, ha useful handouts and some further links as well. What we're looking at here with this webinar is very much about managing the associated health risks with the menopause. And we've looked at diet and we've looked at lifestyle, but there are other approaches to reducing the risks. And, and that is based around HRT. Uh, what, what are the benefits of HRT with regard to what we've discussed already? Yeah, it's um, it's a really interesting um, area to think about. Um, so there are certain areas that we absolutely know with 100% confidence that HRT has an influence on, and particularly, I guess, around bone health and cardiovascular disease. So we know that for, for the time that people are on estrogen, their bones will remain stronger. When we go through menopause without estrogen, our bone density drops over time and increases that risk of, um, of fracture. So whilst we couple lifestyle with HRT, we do really give our bones the best chance of staying strong for as long as possible. And we also know from a cardiovascular disease perspective that for people starting HRT within 10 years of menopause and or under the age of 60, that there's a reduction in the risk of heart attacks and strokes longer term, which I think is something that isn't really well publicized, isn't really well known, but there's an absolute definite clear benefit. So those two things are really key. Um, we also know that there are benefits around bowel, bowel cancer, certain types of certain types of bowel cancer that HRT will reduce the risk. And dementia is an interesting one. I think there's probably as many studies that say that there is benefit in reducing the risk of dementia as there are saying that there are risks associated with HRT and dementia. Um, I guess if we translate it back to cardiovascular disease, we know um, that a certain amount of dementia is related to blood vessel disease in the brain. And so being on HRT, if it's protecting against other disease, will also reduce that risk of vascular dementia. Um, it's a growing area. I think over time we'll see more evidence and we'll be able to be more, um, much more clear um, to be able to advise uh, in more depth. Um, and I guess uh, number five should um, should also be number one. Symptom relief is the main reason that we go on to HRT. Those other benefits are um, almost adjuncts um, and extra bonuses. Um, the symptom relief is the thing that we would feel in the here and now. Um, and, and, you know, that is really important for us being able to get back to our daily functioning. I think that's really interesting. And, and obviously, clearly with myself, for instance, I, I've gone on HRT purely for the symptom relief. But to know that there are these other associated health risks with the menopause and that they can also be reduced with uh, another approach, as in the, the HRT mm -hmm. approach, I think is incredibly uh, useful. So mm -hmm. what sort of hormone treatments are there out there that are involved with HRT? Uh, so, um, as we've said before, oestrogen um, is the key to symptom relief. It's really interesting. This is very much oversimplified, I think, but it, it's it's um, 
uh, being able to describe it in a way that's easy to understand. So estrogen is very good for managing things like hot flushes, some of our mood symptoms. But we also know whilst progesterone is there principally to protect the womb lining, there are progesterone receptors in our brain and in our mood centers in the brain. And so progesterone can have a calming influence and so can help sleep and can help with anxiety symptoms as well. So those two things together can be really beneficial. But for women who have had a hysterectomy, they don't necessarily need progesterone and we'll get many of those benefits from oestrogen alone. Would you mind just elaborating a bit on the testosterone? Because it's not readily available via the NHS. Testosterone is a really interesting one. Not everybody needs it, I think, is the starting point. And if you look at the British Menopause Society guidelines, it talks about using testosterone uh, specifically for libido. I think what we recognise alongside that is that testosterone can help us with other symptoms as well, whether it be aches and pains, as as we've talked about, or mood. Um, or energy levels. There are a few other things that we think it probably helps with, although the studies haven't been uh, done in great detail in this area, but they will come in the future. There are testosterone receptors through our bodies, just as there are estrogen receptors, and our ovaries actually produce more testosterone than they do estrogen. But our testosterone levels are dropping from our 30s, really. They they, they start to drop from an an earlier age, uh, which is why I think the general uh, view is that not everybody should expect to feel the the impact of that because many people continue with a normal libido right through menopause. So still the guidelines talk about testosterone for libido. What we tend to find is that about 70% of women will feel well on estrogen and progesterone alone in terms of their libido and possibly with other symptoms as well, but that there are a group of women who don't respond fully to estrogen and that may get benefit therefore from testosterone. Uh, What it's worth saying about testosterone is that in the UK, there isn't a licensed preparation uh, available freely on the NHS. Uh, There are a couple of male testosterone products that we adapt and use at female doses. Many listeners will probably be aware that there is an Australian product called Androfem, which is designed for women, but that is only available privately. But uh, testosterone can be really beneficial. I think the other thing to say is it doesn't suit everybody. So some people come off it because they don't feel well on it. Um, other people will get significant benefit from it. And then there are a small a small group that will just not feel the benefit in terms of their libido. And the general advice is that if you haven't experienced any benefit from it um, after six months of use, then to come off it because you won't experience any benefit after that. So we've looked at the hormone treatments available. What forms do these take? What, what are the options for, for patients, Kath? Yeah, thanks, Marianne. There's, um, there are a range of different ways of having HRT. I guess the starting point is that if you've not got a womb because you've had a hysterectomy, then you can have estrogen only HRT. Uh, going back to if you still have your womb, you always need estrogen and progesterone. Uh, The progesterone can be in different forms. It could be in a tablet form or a capsule as body identical eutrogestan. It can be in the form of the marina coil, uh, which is probably the best way uh, to have progesterone, but also probably the least acceptable to some women. Not everybody wants to have a coil fitted. Oestrogen then can be uh, taken orally or it can be taken through the skin through as a patch, a gel or a spray. There are combination alternatives for patches and tablets. Uh, If people go for gels and sprays, then they'll tend to have oestrogen gel or spray alongside a body identical progesterone, uh, as described eutrogestan. Um, If people are still having periods or have recently been having periods, then they'll go on to a sequential regime with HRT, which means that they have two weeks on and two weeks off or thereabouts of progesterone. So with the intention to try and replicate their own cycle and align with their own cycle and give them a monthly bleed. But the aim is to get everybody over time onto a continuous dose of estrogen and progesterone and to not have a bleed. So quite commonly women will come going, I don't want HRT because I don't want my periods back. But actually it's only around the time of perimenopause Uh, that people would need to have their periods. Longer term, the intention is always to get people on no bleed preparations. And the really, really important thing to add is around vaginal estrogen. So many women will probably have a settling uh, and improvement of their vaginal symptoms just on through the skin or tablet HRT, but not everybody will experience that benefit. Uh, And there are those women that choose not to or can't have tablet or patch gel spray options for oestrogen and so may very well just choose to have local oestrogen specifically for vaginal symptoms. 
Um, and vaginal estrogen can be in tablet form in pessaries uh, or in creams or in various different kind of gels. And I think, I think my message here is that I would want no woman to suffer with irritation down below. It can also help with urinary symptoms and some sometimes help a little bit with some bowel symptoms as well. So even if people are choosing not to have other kinds of HRT, vaginal estrogen is a really good option just to provide comfort down below. So that's very interesting. So we're, we're saying that you don't necessarily have to have all the HRT to be able to just use the vaginal estrogen. Does exactly. that come as a as a little pessary? Uh, is that the same thing as Vagifem? Is that what we're looking so at? So Vagifem and Vagirux are some good vaginal estrogen options. There's also a Vestin, which is a cream. It's interesting because some people find some things really, really, really love the pessaries, for instance, but find the creams quite messy. And other women will just love the cream rather than the others. So it's very much about, you know, maybe trying one thing if it doesn't suit going and trying another one uh, but really persisting with that and I guess just to back that up with a lot alongside the vaginal estrogen for uh, persistent dryness there are vaginal moisturizers available as well which can be used alongside and can often help with the discomfort um, I'm a big advocate of encouraging women to treat their faces like they uh, or treat their vaginas like they treat their faces and moisturize daily uh, and make sure that it's well looked after down there because we do sit on it every day and need it for an all, a, a whole range of different activities. So, yes, very important yeah. to look after. What are the side effects associated with HRT? Yeah, so bleeding isn't unusual. We almost say, well, we, we certainly don't worry about it if it happens within the first six months of starting HRT for the first time or indeed of changing HRT regimes. And if people um, are on progesterone capsules and they might forget them for a couple of days, it's not unusual to get a bit of bleeding then as well. If people bleed heavily or erratically um, or have persistent bleeding beyond six months, then we would always investigate that to look for any possible causes. But it's just to note that it will usually settle down. It's normally transient on starting HRT and it's worth persisting with. I guess another thing to say is where we mentioned the marina coil before as a really good uh, progesterone option in HRT. It's actually brilliant for contraception the progesterone bit of HRT and managing erratic bleeding, which is something that's very common in perimenopause anyway. So if you've had a real problem with bleeding when you started HRT, it could be that they'll suggest the marina call and that may help you get on top of the bleeding issue so that you can carry on with your HRT. Is that correct? Exactly. It will almost certainly, in most cases, settle bleeding down completely. And what other side effects like weight gain? A lot of people feel that they put on weight. I mean, obviously, during the menopause, we've already talked about the fact that people can gain weight. But some people feel that HRT specifically makes them gain weight. What's your feeling about this? So if we think about perimenopause and menopause, our estrogen levels are dropping and our bodies try to create estrogen in different ways. And one of the ways that our bodies will do that is by storing fat which does produce a, an estrogen type um, compound, but it's not as nice as the estrogen that we have in our bodies and it's not as nice as the estrogen that, that we have in HRT. Um, so it is, um, logic would then say, if you replace that estrogen with HRT, that it shouldn't cause weight gain because it puts our bodies into that state of not needing to store fat anymore. Um, HRT def definitely doesn't cause weight loss or help with weight loss other than by encouraging us to feel better, eat better, think about our lifestyle a bit more. Um, and so it can help in that way. But generally, we wouldn't say, and the studies don't seem to indicate that HRT does cause weight gain. Some people will complain of bloating directly related to their HRT. So nothing to do with IBS. They haven't got any other symptoms. But they say that when they go on HRT, they get bloating. Is that a, a well understood side effect, Kath? Um, I... I'm not sure whether there's an, a definite recognized cause for it, but there is, it's a definite well-documented side effect of estrogen as is breast tenderness as well. So yeah, uh, bloating can be just feeling distended. Um, it may be that I guess there's a little bit of fluid retention related to that as well, or windiness in the bowel. But again, as you say, it's not always related to irritable bowel syndrome. What to do about it is always a challenge. And I think the, the most success I've had um, for women that are suffering with bloating is to drop the dose back down and then very gradually increase it. And that seems to be a way to get people onto a substantial dose that's symptom relieving whilst also minimizing those side effects.
Oh, that's very interesting. So sort of almost titrating the amount mm. up slowly. So bringing them back down to the to their HRT associated bloating disappears and then building them very slowly back up. And they seem to acclimatize to that. Is that correct? Exactly. Engaging that against symptom control, which is where those symptom questionnaires become really, really useful. And then we look at people saying, actually, the, they get worse symptoms when they're on HRT. Is that common? So it's not common. Uh, you know, I think there is an expectation that HRT is this wonder drug. And for those that people that feel really well on it, I think, you know, I, I speak to people most days in my practice who say that it's really changed their lives and changed how things are for them to get them back to normal, you know, going from feeling 2D to 3D and all sorts of different things. Getting my sparkle back is another one. But the reality is that it doesn't suit everybody. And it may be that it's estrogen related um, uh, problems that cause a worsening of symptoms. And for some, it might be progesterone related. And it, it takes a bit of time, I think, and talking to your GP to work through which of those things it might be. But it might be that you feel agitated. It might be you feel bloated. It might be you feel you get breast tenderness. But in general, most people will feel well. But for some, it will feel like a bit of a challenge to get onto HRT and some will therefore stop it and decide not to go back onto it. One of the areas that a lot of people are concerned about because of research that came out several years ago now is the risk of breast cancer with HRT. If you could take us through what the, the concerns are or the actual risks, that would be really helpful. Yeah, so everybody worries about breast cancer, don't they? And I think the overall message that adding HRT into your management of your menopause symptoms is relatively low risk. I think the important things to note are that under 50, if you're under 51, then going on to HRT confers no increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, that what we're doing is replacing the estrogen that 50% of the population will have anyway. And so it's considered to be not increasing the risk at all. I think the other key message is that for women taking estrogen only HRT, that it actually does confer a reduction in risk of breast cancer. And then I think the key message from the slide uh, and the most important thing is that midlife is an opportunity to put in lifestyle changes. And actually what we see here is uh, that any increased risk uh, conferred by HRT can be managed and offset by changing your lifestyle, increasing activity, reducing obesity, um, stopping smoking and, re and reducing alcohol intake. So yes, the opportunity of lifestyle change will offset uh, any risk that is conferred from being on HRT. What happens when you stop HRT? Do you then go through the whole menopause list of symptoms and feel dreadful? I mean, what, what's, what happens when you stop? Because you're only, I gather, supposed to be on HRT for a certain amount of time. Is that correct? Um, so really interesting questions and really interesting to talk about. I think the first thing to say is where people were starting HRT 10, 15, 20 years ago, there was a finite time limit put on it of five years. And that was because there was evidence to suggest that at five years, the risk started to increase. But I guess things have changed over time. And there are some things that perhaps the duration of HRT might increase risk. But, for instance, the British Menopause Society would now say that there isn't a finite limit on the t length of time that you can take HRT for. So there's not a, oh, if I'm going on it now, then in five years time, I'm going to need to come off it or in 10 years, I'm, I need to come off it. What the British Menopause so Society says is that people should have an annual review, a review of their risks and of how they're feeling and uh, discuss the most appropriate treatment ongoing. That might mean that over time, so certainly we find as women get older, they need less estrogen. And obviously, if they're taking progesterone to protect the womb, then the progesterone would continue in the same way. But estrogen wise, you, you find that we tend to try and reduce it over time because people tend to need less because just the way our bodies are behaving, our needs reduce over time. If people are wanting to come off HRT, they can start to wean down their estrogen over time. And if we go back to the chart that we had of the way that hormones behave, You'll remember that going from the nice monthly rhythmic cycle in our reproductive years through to the kind of roller coaster in perimenopause, then things tend to drop down and become much more stable. So if you imagine if you come off HRT in the middle of perimenopause, you'll go back to that cycling. If you go come off HRT in a gradual way, and there are different ways of doing that post-menopause, you're just phasing down to that stable level. And that's not to say that you'll get no symptoms. Estrogen definitely does 
manage symptoms whenever you go on to estrogen, but that you'll have less of a roller coaster if you do come off it. I think my personal plan would be so long as I don't develop other health concerns or problems along the way that I have probably a, a plan to stay on HRT for a very long time. And I do have ladies in their 70s and 80s that say I'm going to wrestle it out of their dead hands um, <laughs> just because it makes them feel so much better, you know, whether it be aches and pains or for some people flushes. And obviously we know it gives that long term protection of bones. The other thing that I say to the women that I'm talking to in practice is that the evidence is going to change over time. So, you know, I, I'm hitting 50 this year. By the time I'm hitting 60, we'll have 10 years more studies to work and ba to base things on. So over time, we'll have different information as well, which will help people make the best decision for them. That is really heartening to hear, Kath, because I think that's one of the big worries for myself. So I had no idea until I've just heard you say that, that I could, in theory, stay on it long term because I, I was worried that I'm going to have to come off it at 60 and I'm going to go mm -hmm. back to where I was before. So that is really heartening. So thank you very much for that. So, Kath, what options do we have if we want to look at HRT? Uh, what type of healthcare professionals are there available for us to go and see to discuss this? So although traditionally people have uh, been along to see their GP with menopause symptoms, in fact, the British Menopause Society are encouraging other professionals to train. So uh, nurses and pharmacists are now training up alongside um, GPs and hospital doctors. Um, so it may be that your local professional um, specialist happens to be a pharmacist or a nurse. So if you look on the BMS website, um, you'll be able to type in your postcode and see where the most local specialist to you will be. Um, there are areas of the country that some areas have a lot more men menopause specialists than others, and that's the kind of thing that we're looking at trying to expand. Okay, and will some of those be on the NHS or some of them private? There's a mixture, but actually you can look at both on the BMS website, so it will say which are NHS and which are private. And that could be nurses, pharmacists or GPs? Exactly that, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Kath, I, I understand that in April this year, the NHS brought out a new prescription scheme for for women on HRT. Would you mind telling us a bit about that? Because I think that would be really useful for a lot of women watching this webinar. Yeah, for those that don't know or aren't aware. Um, so up until April, uh, we had to pay for the individual items on our prescription for every prescription. And there have been a lot of national campaigning around obtaining HRT for free, like we do for the contraceptive pill. We've not quite got that far and hopefully we will in the future. But what was agreed was that we would pay once a year for all of our estrogen and progesterone uh, prescriptions not for testosterone so that sits outside of this remit so people can either speak to their pharmacist about it or log on to nhs bsa online and there they can fill in a form it's very quick i've done it myself that enables you to then access prescriptions so you pay once in the year for two items for estrogen and progesterone and that then enables you to obtain estrogen as much as you need according to your uh, prescription progesterone at the same and then vaginal estrogen as well as included so people might choose not to have hrt and some people can't have hrt and i guess that for me it's about saying that you know there's still ways and means of managing your symptoms uh, so vaginal moistures and lubricants uh, moisturizers and lubricants um, are, can be really really helpful even if you choose not to have vaginal estrogen and um, i think the key is when um, it, it's more important if you choose not to go on HRT or can't have HRT to really know your symptoms, because there are a range of different treatment options, but they're a bit more targeted. There are certain antidepressants that are really good for mood and for sweats. Gabapentin can be is a particular kind of medication that can be used for a range of things, including pain management, but it's also been found to help with sweats. Interestingly, cognitive behavioral therapy that um, is a talking therapy to do with managing anxiety and things has been found to be really beneficial generally in menopause symptoms, but also specifically in hot sweats. And there are spe specific techniques around CBT and management of hot sweats. So I guess uh, the message here for, for, for those people listening is really know your symptoms, keep track and if you're going to go along to your doctors to talk about your symptoms and how you're feeling then do it in the context of these are the symptoms and this is the impact how can you help me with managing these things if I'm not going to have HRT and what about taking time for yourself because I think this is really important particularly in the busy world that we all live in mm -hmm. what are yeah. your feelings both of you about about this 
So I recently moved up to the Lake District and in doing so I have found a community of people that perhaps are just a bit more condensed in Kendall where I work. And so there's lots of cold water swimming groups and there's lots of people who are who do yoga and mindfulness. And so I, I, I think it's made me certainly want to make more time for myself through having a community of other people that are in that space as well. And it's just so important that we stop and regularly and actually factor it into the day. And I think sometimes... Probably as women and particularly probably, you know, if we have families to look after, uh, whether it be children or parents or, you know, other people that we look after, quite often we feel guilty about making the time for ourselves. But I think it's just so crucial. And, you know, I think most of us feel that need more to feel connected in this midlife time. And yeah, so it's just saying, you know, whatever that way is that you find that time for yourself, prioritize it and don't feel guilty about it. I think, you know, we, we talk about menopause. I'm always conscious that it sounds like it. if you, if I was in my 30s listening to this, I'd be thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm dreading this time. It's uh, yeah, we're all doomed. But actually, it's it's a time for change. It's a time to embrace the change that are happening with our bodies. And it's t- a time to take control. And I think, you know, um, if if what we can learn from this is how our bodies work a little bit more and the things that we can do differently, then so much the better. Um, so there's something about knowing your symptoms and how they affect you. And I think particularly if you are moving along a journey that might end up with a consultation, then symptom questionnaires or symptom trackers. So for instance, Balance Menopause website has a good symptom questionnaire and the Balance app has a symptom tracker. It's a really good way of gaining insight into which symptoms you're experiencing actually might be something to do with menopause. But I think in terms of a conversation with your GP, how they're affecting you is really important as well. Partly because, you know, every conversation about menopause doesn't need to end in a prescription of HRT. And sometimes it's good to be specific about, well, it's this thing that's really bothering me and it's this that I'd like to to improve can be really helpful to kind of think about other options as well, because not everybody wants to take hormones and not everybody can. So I think if, if we only talk about HRT, again, it feels like a very negative place to be. Uh, But I think in terms of taking control, knowing what your options are is important, but also knowing your personal risks and also knowing what risks aren't a reason not to have HRT. So things like migraine and blood clots, historically, people on people, well, you can't have tablet HRT or tablet estrogen um, if you've had a history of clots or a history of migraine or a history of high blood pressure, but you can have estrogen through the skin. I think a lot of people come saying, oh, well, I can't have it because, well, actually a lot of the time you can, if you want, if you choose to have that. And I guess family history of breast cancer is different than a personal history of breast cancer. So they're all things to know to gain your own personal expectation, almost of if you're going to go to the doctor, what it is that you can, um, that you should expect. Thank you, Kath. I feel we have learned so much through this hour long webinar and as we draw to a close now, what I'd really like to do is just summarise the main points. So Leah took us through aiming for a healthy weight or realistic weight loss and eating a balanced diet. So plenty of plant based foods, reducing your saturated fat and sugar intakes increasing your fats from plant foods like avocado, olive oil, sunflower oil, and increasing your intake of omega-3 fats with fish or green leafy vegetables, walnuts and various seeds. We also looked at limiting your alcohol, bringing it down within safe limits, and that some people during the menopause actually find they can't tolerate alcohol as well, and it can affect sleep. So really looking at your alcohol intake, and then making other lifestyle changes like stopping smoking, And being physically active can make a huge difference. And Kath explained brilliantly the background behind HRT and what the options are. And we realised that HRT isn't suitable for everybody and many people won't want to use it. But if it's something you want to consider, go to your GP and ask about it and get all the information you can because there is certainly increasing research showing that HRT can help reduce the risk of developing health complications associated with the menopause. And finally, they talked about taking time for yourself. This is so important. It's important for our mental health. It's important for stress. Really important during the menopause, particularly that you take time for yourself. So I'd just like to finish by saying a huge thank you to Kath Munro and Leah Seamart for their expert knowledge today. 
I've certainly found this webinar extremely useful and I really hope that the people listening to this webinar will also find it very helpful. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.